to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live. We are in Ottawa, Ontario, and we are at the University of Ottawa, which overlooks the Parliament buildings. I can see it through the window here. It also overlooks National Defense. And this week there is an event at the Canadian War Museum, book launch, launching several books uh, related to Canadian military history. And we're lucky enough today to have one of the authors of those books, military and naval historian from the Directorate of History and Heritage at National Defense Headquarters, written a book entitled Unlikely Diplomats, the Canadian Brigade in Germany, 1951 to 1964. It's Isabel Campbell. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks very much, Sean. Uh, I'm very excited to have you here and to, to discuss this book, because as we were just talking about, this is something that I don't know much about, uh, this issue of Canadians in Germany after the Second World War. And I, I do know, however, there was a girl who I did my undergraduate with who, when she was a kid, she was in Germany because her father was there. So I do know that there was there's a presence in Germany. I'm just not Germany. I'm just not entirely sure why. So I I guess the first question is, uh, you know, after the Second World War, Canada's very triumphant, very excited. We won the war. Why is there this decision made to place Canadians in Germany in the the post-war period? Well, first of all, uh, you brought up the the Second World War, and of course, uh, Canadians withdrew uh, forces uh, from Germany uh, fairly rapidly at the end of the Second World War for a variety of reasons, uh, most of them uh, domestic Mm -hmm. in terms of uh, Prime Minister King's uh, policies at that time. By 1951, uh, the world has changed. And the backdrop is, of course, the Cold War between the two superpowers. But for Canada, and in terms of why... I think much of it had to do with a fight for an independent voice and a voice that would be heard mm-hmm. within the NATO alliance that formed in 1949. Mm-hmm. So I think the reason why Canadians became present there was to represent uh, Canada in a visible and unique way. Mm. And are they, who are, they, are they representing themselves or are they representing NATO? Um, or is there a distinction between the two? Well, that's, that's actually a really <laughs> um, uh, refined question, mm-hmm. and, and I like it uh, a lot. And I think uh, the answer is, is indeed both. When Canadians go in 1951, all the other nations in um, uh, Germany, serving in Germany, are occupation forces. Mm. So the distinction when Canadians claim to be NATO is already a unique one. Right. Because um, their claim uh, to the West Germans, who they are trying to win over, for sort of the Western alliance, Mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, Western Germany is not, at that point, allied. Mm -hmm. The the whole uh, tenor of Canada's campaign there is that we will treat the Germans like equals and also that we're not there to occupy you, we are are there to defend you. Mm -hmm. So that is, in fact, uh, very much Canada's line, Mm -hmm. and um, they actually do battle with Britain and France on that particular policy matter, Mm -hmm. and so they're out of line with um, the occupying powers. Did the Germans initially see them as in this light, or were they lumped in with the other occupying powers? Like, were they received in a in a positive way? In fact, what you find is uh, both things happening, oh. uh, depending on who you talk to. Okay. Uh, so Adenauer, uh, who has won uh, the election by one vote. <laughs> so, so just to, to make it very clear, it's, yeah. a, it's not just a divided Germany in terms of East and West, mm-hmm. but within West Germany, uh, there's a very, very large portion of the population that's social democratic and that doesn't like the idea of being allied with the West because they see that that might make their uh, country a battleground. Mm-hmm. So some of them are hoping for something more of a neutral um, status like Austria mm-hmm. and hoping that perhaps all these occupation f- uh, forces will leave right. and allow Germany to unite. So that's still very much a hope in 1951. And in addition, some Germans worry that they are already, through occupation uh, policies, paying for the presence of foreign forces. Mm. So they worry that Canadians will add to the costs. Mm. A lot of Germans are homeless, they're hungry, they're unemployed. Are there many displaced people there? So you're talking about very difficult circumstances. Mm. On the other hand, Adenauer, who does want to ally with the West, uh, very much likes uh, Canadian policies, Mm. uh, which are to treat the Germans as equals and are to kind of win them to the Western side. And that's very much in line with Adenauer's sort of philosophy. Mm. So Adenauer and his sort of uh, group of um, 
individuals who are very closely allied with the Americans see Canadian policy as lining up quite nicely mm. with what they'd like to achieve. Mm. So if the election goes the other way, and two, pe- two more people show up to vote the other way, the official response might, have, might not have been as positive. I, I, indeed. And so what we find is, is that the Social Democrats are being wooed as well. Okay. Uh, certainly Canadians are wooing them. The British are wooing them. Everybody's yeah. wooing the Social Democrats because they're, they're seen to have, well, not only uh, to represent a fair uh, number of people, but they're also seen to have a, a bit of credibility mm. and to be people you could work with, mm. as eventually they were able to. Right. You know, uh, when other right. social democrats uh, do uh, form the government later mm. on in, in Germany, mm. and and of course this is 1951 when yep. Canada shows up. Uh, like you say, <clears throat> Germany has been ravaged during the Second World War and is in a yeah. tough spot. So obviously there's there's reasons why outside forces would want to be there to help oversee the reconstruction of Germany. Absolutely, but at the same time, at least Canada and the United States. I don't know about Britain. I'm sure you do, and you can tell me. But uh, are involved in Korea. At the oh, same yes, absolutely. Time. Yes, they are. Yes, and um, Britain so, as so well. Br- yeah. Britain's there as well. So, and we, in fact, serve with um, British forces. Okay. Yeah. So if there's this notion that the Canada in Germany is trying to be viewed differently from the way the British and the, the Americans are, if they're viewed as occupiers, Canada wants to be seen as a more uh, a friendlier yeah. presence. And yet we're, the Canadians, British, and Americans are all working together in Korea. Is there any tension between those two things going on? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of tension, and some of uh, some of the tension is, you know, differences. In, these are very different places, very different goals going yeah. on. In Korea, while you've got actual, you know, fighting going on, and it's it's pretty tough mm-hmm. uh, circumstances. On the other hand, uh, someone like uh, Brooke Claxton, who is our Minister of National Defense, declares Korea is essentially a sideshow. Mm-hmm. That strategically speaking, in terms of importance, Germany is, is where it's at. Oh. Uh, so, although the brigade in Germany is not actually fighting. Mm-hmm. It's perceived to have a much greater strategic value. Mm-hmm. And that's, of course, because uh, Germany is such a prize. Mm-hmm. Is it because it's is, is it viewed as such a prize because it's so vulnerable? Uh, or because of the situation with between East and West Germany? Um, both. And, and um, it, it's kind of, it, it's really interesting because if you go Prior to this time period, and you look at 1947, and you look at kind of Canadian policy towards Germany mm-hmm. in, in just that immediate post-war period, uh, some of the thinking that's going on politically in Canada is that, you know, Germany is a problem, but it's also a solution. Mm. And that's uh, really what I've tried to bring out in my book, is that if you can use West German resources to strengthen all of Western Europe, if you can use that whole society to contribute to a Western Europe strength, both economically, the whole idea of a united Europe. Mm-hmm. So Canadians see that as a long-term security thing. Mm. And so they want to participate in that, and they want to uh, contribute to that, partly because they're very optimistic, overly optimistic, about the possibility of trading with the united Europe. Right. And the idea that, oh, well, you know, they'll make great trading partners, and they'll offset the Americans and, and uh, mm. enhance our sort of uh, North Atlantic Triangle. There's that optimistic uh, and... and uh, and, and, and the idea that trade itself might create peace, you know, that's, that's not completely... It's, it's, it's an interesting mixture of self-interest and idealism. Mm. Yeah, you know? definitely. And um, much of it overly optimistic because, of course, the United Europe uh, develops trade barriers against North American uh, mm. trade. But even under those circumstances, Canadians who are involved in that thinking are always saying, well, a United Europe will be good for us mm. for security reasons. So uh, this this notion of between like well there's there's selfish reasons to be there absolutely uh, for for Canada. One of the things that I wondered when I was thinking about this is, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I yeah. think there are people in this country who were disappointed that Canada was not included, uh, did not get a permanent seat on the Security Council of the United Nations. Is that a motivating factor in what they're doing in Germany? To say, well, why, we, we should have gotten a permanent seat. Why don't we get a permanent seat? Let's go show how effective we can be in these international arenas in terms of getting... Because if part of this is to woo West Germany into NATO and get them to sign up, well, you know, we're going to be the leading force in this, and we're going to get them on board to show you how effective we can be. Is there sort of a, you know, there's, there's a response to that at all? My book hasn't exactly gone in that Mm -hmm. specific direction. I would say that their goals were perhaps a little more modest than that. And I would think that at times, 
all they wanted to do was become better informed. Okay. Because what happens with respect to Germany uh, when Canada is not an occupying power, and for example, the lead up to the Berlin crisis, is we're not actually part of you know, the six nations mm. that are negotiating on sort of European matters at that point. Right. And so we're kind of left out of mm. uh, some of the councils. And in fact, what you find is Pearson, and I've, I've got it um, a, a lot in chapter two and three, where Pearson is a little bit out of um, touch with Allied policy. Mm. And so he stumbles a few times. And he stumbles in the Berlin crisis. At uh, one point, he thinks that, that they're going to withdraw. He mm. doesn't think that they're actually going to go to war for Berlin even though he thinks that Canada should be taking part in that um, Berlin airlift mm -hmm. in uh, 1948. So he stumbles because he's out of touch. And I think some of the reason to send a brigade and become involved and is to get a seat at the table so that our planning can be more coherent. Oh, okay. And I think the idea is a seat at the table for sure. Mm -hmm. But as for taking a lead, there's no question that Canada does at certain moments take the lead. But I'm not sure that even Pearson, who's such an optimistic character mm -hmm. and so very persuasive, is quite that I, I, I confident mm. about, you know, Canada's such a minor nation. Right. I don't think that he imagines that we'd have quite that kind of power and influence. Okay. But over time, this book looks from uh, 51 to 64. Yes. Uh, so obviously, Lester Pearson is not the prime minister for the, yep. the, the whole Diefen 13 Baker years. For much Diefen, of the time. Diefen Baker comes in. So is there a change in that philosophy with the change of government? Interestingly enough, and, and, and there are certainly changes. There's no question. I mean, Diefen Baker has um, a lot of different ideas that he's trying to promote. Mm -hmm. But when you actually look at the sort of applied policy, Mm -hmm. And, you know, th it's the same diplomats, it's the same right. military leaders. And so yeah. th uh, the thing I found rather tragic is by the time David Baker loses government, he's actually really understanding what it's all about. Mm -hmm. But by then he's... <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> it's, too late. <laughs> it's too late. When he first comes yeah. into power, it's a steep learning curve. Right. And some of that steep learning curve is because the, peer, uh, the, um, the Saint Laurent government has kept so much secret. Mm. And NATO itself is so secret. Right. So it does take uh, Diefen Baker quite a while to get up to speed. Mm. Mm. And it's not entirely his fault. Right, yeah. <laughs> Although some of it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things. I mean, I, I've never been involved in the public service at a professional level. I mean, I know, obviously, in this town, it's impossible not to know a bunch of people who work in the public service. And that's the sense you get is that even when there's a change of government, which hasn't happened since I've lived here, but even when there's been change of ministers... The day-to-day -day doesn't really change within the, the, the public service. And so, I mean, these diplomats yeah. who are on this project, sure, maybe over, the overarching thing might change, but day-to-day -day they're kind of doing the same thing regardless of who's in power. Well, they're giving advice to the government. Yeah. Um, and if the advice is good advice, it tends to be followed. It doesn't mean that, you know, if the government changes directions, indeed, um, Everybody changes directions. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, policy towards Germany, uh, Diefenbaker is very impressed by Adenauer when he meets him. Uh, he impresses a lot of people. He's an extraordinarily mm. intelligent and uh, cunning kind of mm. individual. And so uh, we don't find uh, a dramatic change with regard to, to Germany, at least not with regard to the brigade. Mm. Now, in terms of the Air Force, there are uh, right. significant changes during the mm. Diefenbaker period, but I don't deal with that. Okay, book. okay. And... I, I guess this also then begs the question when we're, we're talking about how changes in government are going to affect the operations, uh, who are the people in this brigade? Like, who is being sent to do this work in Germany? And, and why were those different people, maybe not so much individuals as maybe positions, uh, yeah. the type of work that they're doing? What type of, pe what type of people are being selected to go? This is a, a really good question. I'm so glad you asked that one. Because uh, really, ultimately, the book is about the people mm. who were sent. And in the early years, uh, we have short-term uh, service commission, along with, you know, there's some regulars, which means permanent people who are kind of in the forces as a profession. Right. But the bulk of the brigade, uh, from 51 to 54, are short-term commission uh, reservists who are out on call. Out. Okay. So they, they didn't ever intend to do this as a career. They're mm. just doing it for a short time. And the bulk of them are set without their families. Mm. And so for three years? Uh, or how long are the, the uh, uh, postings? Uh, it's one year if they're married and two years if they're not. Okay. So it's, um, that's the initial okay. sort of uh, service or in terms of service. What happens is with Korea on and this, you have a lot of people coming in. 
Uh, many of them are unsuitable soldiers. Um, many of them don't last long. And even those who are very suitable soldiers become very disillusioned very quickly. Mm. So you have this huge turnover of personnel. And you also have a brigade that's on duty 24 hours, seven days a week. They're forced to wear uniforms, very, very long hours, very tough conditions. Wow. They're restless, they're bored, they're not happy. Right. A couple hundred families come without permission and support, including uh, Brigadier Wash brings his own wife against uh, mm-hmm. Simmons' orders. Wow. He's been away from his wife for most of his career, and he's just had enough. So even the brigadier has brought his wife. But the conditions under which they're living are such that the wife lives in a hotel. They get to see their wife a couple of hours a week with a leave form. Okay. They're not even permitted to stay overnight. Wow. So you're talking about extremely kind of brutal living yeah. conditions. And so over the course from 51 to 54, that's the sort of state you've got. And there's a huge battle that goes on within the Department of National Defense. And eventually, it's actually the Air Force that kind of wins this battle. Because one-third of the airmen who have been sent overseas have their families with them without support or permission. Mm-hmm. And so... The head of the Air Force sees this as a real problem. He wants to keep his good guys, and he believes his good, more senior people, his experienced NCOs, are married with children, Mm -hmm. and he wants to support them and make it possible for them to have a life. Mm -hmm. So one of the big themes in my book is how the quality of life within the military becomes uh, a very important goal for the military to support. It also becomes an important goal for the Canadian government because you want to represent Canadian life in this positive way. Sure. So we end up putting a lot of resources into families, schools, skating rinks, recreational (laughs) centers, which I think demonstrates very clearly to the Germans, we don't really expect the Soviets to attack. Right. You know, much more clearly than a tank, Mm -hmm. a kindergarten with a whole bunch of small Canadian children Mm. would represent to the Germans uh, safety and security. Mm -hmm. So the message becomes very much this kind of diplomatic message Mm. rather than this kind of combat-ready message. So a lot of the Canadian defense dollars are spent on these uh, soft items. And so who is sent changes. So by 1964, you're looking at more than half the brigade is married. Uh, You've got a lot of families and a lot of resources to supporting families. Mm -hmm. And the brigadiers, the ones in charge, Brigadier Cameron is sending out things like they've got a community newspaper, they've got a radio station. You've got all this kind of community stuff going Mm -hmm. on. And as he said, you're sort of, um, as he says to all of his commanding officers, you're not here just commanding men. You're actually a father confessor. You're a marriage counselor. Mm. You are you know, yeah. <laughs> all these other things yeah. and comportments. Mm. How you get along with the Germans and how you represent uh, the nation becomes uh, more and more and more important. Mm. So the brigade changes its mm. role quite dramatically. And again, th- forgive me on this. Are we talking about... When we talk, okay, so this is before unification. So we have yep. Army, Navy, and Air, Force. Air Force, three distinct things, but all with a presence there? No, the brigade in Germany is pretty much on its own at this point. Okay. And this is something that changes in the Trudeau era where they bring them all together right. and make a Canadian enclave. Yeah. Um, that idea has come up earlier and it's considered from time to time. Mm-hmm. But the Air Force is in France and Germany okay. and, and bases that are not in the British territory. Mm. The brigade is isolated all by itself as part of the British Army of the Rhine in northern Germany. Okay. And it's located in a very vulnerable, key spot. So when I talk about the fact that, you know, they've got all the stability and all the rest of it, it doesn't mean that their, their military role had no importance. Mm. They were, in fact, at one of the most vulnerable spots mm. on the broad uh, northern German plains. Okay, and their army yeah. guy, the, they're, that this is the army. Th- this is the army. Yeah, land forces. Okay, and now one of the the things when I hear the the word diplomat, mm-hmm. I immediately assume civilian. Yeah. Right. So a civilian who is working for the army, and and the D and D building is just across the street from us here, and it's full of civil servants who work D and D, and and a lot of whom go internationally. And so when I think of, you know, people from the army living in Germany. I think of those types of people, but these are active members uh, of the army who are soldiers. Absolutely. And when I use the term unlikely diplomats, I'm very broad. I think mm-hmm. I'm speaking about not just the soldiers, but their families, because their families did represent mm-hmm. Canada in a diplomatic role. And in, in one uh, case in the slides I'll present uh, tomorrow night, you actually have family members being fingerprinted, which I think really? kind of symbolizes oh, wow. um, just how much they were kind of inducted into the yeah. military. And, um, you know, it affected all aspects of um, a military wife's life, right? Mm -hmm. All aspects of her life would be um, 
very much affected. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Lard's wife who serves with a General Lard when he is a commander of one of the British divisions. And she talks about the fact that she wants to do German lessons. Uh-huh. And the British commander refuses to let her do it because Wednesday afternoons are reserved for sports days. Uh-huh. So, you know, th- the military affects them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between, when we were talking about having families there, like, there's a difference between a civilian who works for the army. Absolutely. And, and a, a soldier. soldier. Yeah, the soldier is owned. Right. And so they don't, yeah, they don't have the same type of, I don't know if rights is the proper word to use in that situation. I think it is the right word. Um, I, I would agree with okay. that. Okay. A lawyer might disagree with us, right, but yeah. I'm, I think it, it makes yeah. sense to me. Right. And because they have to be, a, a soldier who's deployed has to be ready to fight. Absolutely. Right. Whereas a civilian doesn't. Absolutely. Right. So there's a different expectation there. So I can yeah. understand why there'd be this reticence to have families there. And Initially, especially. And yeah. It, yeah. So over time, then, as as this progresses, as families are, are sent over more and more, it becomes more of a, a, a social environment. Yeah. Do we see a lessening of the the readiness of soldiers to fight? Is there a sense of normalcy that sets in, if not complacency, when they're saying, well, nothing's going to happen? That's a, that's a really good question. And I, I think the um, from, from the period that I'm talking about, mm-hmm. the Canadian Army always um, took the tact that it was training to fight. Okay. Okay. Now, it, it in fact, when you look at the actual combat plans, and I've got um, places where I'm uh, talking about, you know, Brigadier Mike Dare, who talks about the plans as being, you know, suicidal, real. I mean, he doesn't actually say that word, but um, the implication is uh, when he talks to John Starnes, who is the ambassador, there's a point where Allard and uh, Mike Dare and uh, Starnes are talking, and he's basically, um, Starnes writes back to Canada and calls it Shades of Hong Kong. Oh, wow. uh, As as, uh, really the military plans are so very, very unrealistic. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that they ever stop preparing. Mm -hmm. At all times, um, you know, a guy like Mike Dare, who's a real... um, an armored core, absolutely, you know, hardcore soldier, led his men. He was terribly worried about if, if battle ever did come, that um, it, you know, wasn't a, a really great role to be mm-hmm. in. But one of the ways that they kind of masked that is in many, many of the exercises, Canada would play Redland or Soviet mm-hmm. forces. Mm-hmm. So they always get to win. <laughs> <laughs> so that would always make them yeah. feel, you know, whoa, you know, yeah. guys, you know, we, we took on that British division and invaded yeah. them and took over all their yeah. posts and stuck in. But, you know, it, 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 um, they, they managed to keep up the morale uh-huh. uh, by those kind of means, mm-hmm. right? But anybody who looked at the casualty figures, I have a, by the 80s, a friend of mine who I actually uh, used to work with, he's retired now, tells a joke about uh, looking at the casualty figures when he served in Germany and saying to, you know, his commanding officers, sir, you know, some of us are going to have to die multiple times right, yeah. um, to, <laughs> to <laughs> allow this sort of battle to take place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was that kind of um, uh, lack of realism. Mm. But it didn't mean that they weren't combat ready and it didn't mean that mm. they didn't train and it didn't mean that they didn't continue to train hard mm. because that was their job, right? right. But if you mentioned earlier, if they're putting people who have maybe washed out from the Korean War, uh, who said, well, th- this is no good, and are then being sent to Germany, is there not an impression there that officially they don't think it's something's going to happen? If they're putting guys there who maybe they don't have the most confidence in. I don't think they're doing that. Okay. And, in fact, uh, the evidence is quite the opposite. Okay. Okay. When you look at Claxton where he says, you know, uh, Korea is a sideshow. Yeah. Um, if you're combat ready uh, in that early time frame, you are sent to Germany. Okay. Uh, there's no feeling, I think, at any point in that early time frame that, that the people being sent there are in any way less combat ready. Now, that said... If you look at any military, and this is true of all militaries around the world, you have your combat soldiers, you have your administrative soldiers, you have your logistics soldiers, you have soldiers who can do other things. Mm-hmm. So if I'm in the military and I'm you know, obedient and I'm living up to all expectations, but I'm really not a fighter, mm-hmm. I might turn out to be a driver right. or a, a cook mm-hmm. or um, the man who, who uh, manages the laundry unit. Mm. There's lots of other tasks that militaries have. Um, and they can assign you those kind of duties. And those are available in Korea and Germany and right. indeed in Canada. Was there a, a procedure to decide who would go where then? Or was it kind of a sort of luck of the draw? I'm in the military. I'm an okay guy. I, I can handle a gun. 
from what I understand, guys don't get to request where they go. No, so no, it has to do, in the early time period, it's Panda, which is, uh, there's a huge recruitment effort gone on, first for uh, Korea, and then, secondly, for the brigade. Mm. So people sign up, they train, and they go with their unit. Right. So you would sign up uh, with a particular unit, right. and you would go when your unit is sent, and people rotate by units. So, but, yeah, but would so I be signing up for a unit knowing where it's going to go? Uh, well, um, I think initially the, rec- the uh, our initial panda recruitment is done for Korea. So initially mm. there would be this huge um, recruitment campaign throughout newspapers all across Canada. Mm-hmm. And you, as a young man, and uh, exclusively males during the yeah. time frame that we're talking yeah. about, although later uh, in the 50s, of course, women do join and reserve uh, uh, the reserve units mm. and, uh, and serve. But in this time frame, you would say, yeah, I'm, I want to serve in Korea, and you join your unit, and you train. And then when your unit is ready, it would be sent. Mm. Uh, and so you would have signed up for that service. Mm. Okay. Now, one of, one of the things that, it, it, to me, I, a lot of this is really interesting to me. I, I realize I say this on every episode, so for people who listen to every episode, I apologize. But one of the things that, that stands out to me is that here we are, the Canadian, we have Canadian forces in Germany during ostensibly peacetime. And you can argue what peace is. Yeah, uh, yeah. And what the definition of peace is. Absolutely. But we have a, a army on standby, ready to go if needed. Yet we have a narrative in this country that after the Second World War, we are very much peacekeepers. Mm-hmm. Does the idea of a standing army in West Germany following the Second World War counter that narrative? I, I think very broadly you could interpret it either way. I mean, mm-hmm. we have Maloney's book about how you know peacekeeping is sort of Cold War by other means, but you could also argue that the Cold War is peacekeeping by other means, right, yeah, yeah. depending on how yes. you could flip it on its yes. head. And I actually think it would really depend on how you wanted to look at it. Certainly when I look at the brigade, I'm looking very much at its role in creating stability. Mm-hmm. Because war did not break out, very much their role was to create a sense of security and stability. And if you look at the type of spending and priorities by 1964, I think you can say that that sort of stability role was very, very important. Mm. You're not building a skating rink uh, rather than buying a weapon unless you think that peace is really important and Mm. peace is going to happen. Right. So I think you could argue it. Mm. Now, that said... I've told her they train for combat. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I think I think uh, you know I I guess I come mm-hmm. somewhere down squarely in the middle of this yes. Yes. <laughs> in saying that <laughs> it's it's uh, because uh, because peace was kept mm-hmm. it could be interpreted mm-hmm. as contributing to that peace. Mm-hmm. Now one of the things it says uh, on the UBC Press website I don't know if it says this on the, the back of the book as well but it says that for years there's been a specific narrative about the brigade in Germany that new documents that you have been able to go through, recently declassified documents, challenge that narrative a little bit. So, mm-hmm. for, so, so first of all, what was the established narrative in the historiography about the brigade, and what type of documents were declassified that allowed you to, to re-examine that narrative? So there's a couple of parts of that narrative that I would say I've, I've questioned. Certainly... Many of the books which have written about um, the Canadian experience in Germany made it sound like Canadians were very, very welcome, very well liked. And more than that, we kind of believed our own propaganda, Mm -hmm. that Canadians are so wonderful that everybody everywhere just loves us and thinks we're so much more wonderful than the Americans and everybody else. And I think what I found is is that um, if you look at, especially the early time frame, we were as unpopular as anyone else. We had our share of drunken soldiers who got out of line, and what you found was, according to different German newspapers, like if it was a communist newspaper or a newspaper that wasn't in favor of foreign troops being there, mm. they would dramatize those events mm. and make everything they could of it. Uh, so when uh, Germany is in this very disrupted state, West Germany I'm talking not yeah. simply the, the the division of the country, but the fact that West Germany is not necessarily integrated into NATO in the early 50s, you find a lot of dramatization of misbehavior. Mm. And, of course, there is misbehavior. Mm. Sure. And so what I found was that part of the myth, right? We're not better than anyone else. Right. We're just the same. Mm. <laughs> Big surprise. Yeah. Okay, so that's that part of the, the thing. And if you look at, of course, the um, regimental histories, and the histories that were kind of um, 
endorsed by particular people, you, they're, they're histories that are designed to build morale. Mm -hmm. And so that's very important for mm -hmm. units, right? They want to take pride. So you want to tell them that they're good because that promotes good behavior. Sure. Right? So you want to give them pride in their uniform and all mm -hmm. the rest of it. So there are very mm -hmm. important reasons for having history that really emphasizes uh, all the good. Mm -hmm. uh, but mine's a little bit more critical than that. Mm -hmm. So right. I certainly do talk about some of the less favorable events that mm. went down and some of the um, German objections to mm. Canadian behavior. Other things that happened, um, we um, were not able to rent enough housing mm. and uh, for our families, so we requisitioned housing from the Germans. Oh. So for some Germans, if your house was requisitioned, if there was good places to live and you were homeless, yeah. um, it's very hard to distinguish Canadian troops from occupation forces. Sure. And that's actually not to do with comportment. That has more to do with actual policies yeah. that are being implemented. We uh, requisitioned a good part of the world forest and destroyed part of it for our bases. Oh. That did not lead to great popularity because, of course, the Germans really, really like their forests. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and it was a very ancient forest of, you know, long-standing, uh, mm. uh, many centuries of untouched kind mm. of wilderness. That hurt. So, so there are things like that where I'm challenging that kind of the, uh, the part of the narrative. Other things in terms of the, the recently declassified stuff, we find that Der Spiegel, for example, uh, published accounts of what the devastation would be in Germany if battle did come, and especially once you get nuclear weapons. So by the mid-1950s, the German population is quite aware of what would go on if the Soviets ever attacked. Mm. What I found when I initially was working at DND as an archivist, I was declassifying stuff, and lo and behold, I found this Der Spiegel article, translated into English, and sent back to Canada as top secret. Oh. It was still top secret <laughs> in the late 1980s. And the interesting thing about that is if you were a German-speaking Canadian who subscribed to Der Spiegel... You had it. You had it. Yeah. The people who didn't have it, ironically enough, were the comedians. Mm. And so I found that really, really yeah, fascinating in terms is. of this whole idea of what are Canadians allowed to know? Right. And what do we know about our own past and our own history? Yeah. And one of the ironies that I've seen right along as I've been doing research, and I've been in this business for quite a while, is uh, for a long period, Canadian military and foreign policy historians could get releases from the States but they would get American versions right. of what had happened. The Brits have the same problem, because mm -hmm. the Americans do make unilateral releases mm -hmm. of information. We, on the other hand, go through the Department of you know, Defate, and uh, we send things down and ask for permission, and we're always told no. Mm -hmm. So during the time period when I was involved as an archivist declassifying things, there was this really, really um, funny time period where you'd find historians would go down, they'd get copies of things on nuclear policy, they'd come back, and um, we wouldn't be able to release the Canadian version. So what we mm. started to do is I started to say to people, is if you bring me the American version, I will insert it in the file, and I'll release the Canadian version. Right. So we started to do that, mm. just so we could get that Canadian story out there. So sure. it's very, very, very important to mm. tell. And so some of the book contains really, really, what I think are very important Canadian critiques mm. of NATO strategy, mm -hmm. NATO plans. We find Simmons absolutely condemning in the early 1950s, the idea that strategic bombing would affect uh, the battle at an early stage. So the idea that he had was that if the Soviets attacked, by the time strategic bombing, even with, the, and there weren't a great many nuclear bombs in that early time frame, but even with some nuclear bombs, mm -hmm. it would be too late. The mm -hmm. Soviet army would have overrun Germany, right. and all our soldiers would be wiped out. Mm -hmm even with, you know, a fighting withdrawal to the Rhine, which right. is what they plan to do. So you find some really, really good criticisms, and those um, those are new releases. Okay. And um, I, I think they're very valuable. Sure, sure. And if, to get those, was that, I mean, talk about how difficult it can be dealing with defate and trying to get things declassified. Well, it's not defate, but it's it's not defate that says no. They send it to the states, and then the okay, states, and states says say no. no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, was what was the process that the stuff has been now declassified that you were able to get your hands on? I mean, are you doing ATIP? 
request? Well, no. Or, or what or happened was really, really very valuable, and it has nothing like... I, 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 I should be very, very careful that the DPA people I worked with were extraordinarily cooperative, mm. and, um, and we're very grateful to them for their work in making things available. What really happened was the Cold War ended, Oh, yeah. And NATO started to release things, and the mm. Americans made massive releases. And, and um, you know, people like, uh, wonderful people like John Clearwater uh, kind of broke the ice, mm. and other people made a- ATIP requests, and so we were able to make more and more and more releases. Mm. So there was a kind of a decade before um, 9-11 when we mm. made progress. Mm. And then, of course, 9-11 uh, caused things to be shut down all over right. again. Now, one of the things the book does, or, or the blurb about the book does mention is that this optimistic narrative that exists that you challenge uh, in the book was also maybe perhaps challenged by the people on the ground that maybe they weren't so optimistic all the time about what was going on as well or or perhaps that's the official people in Ottawa that that publicly they're presenting a very united front that we're going to go do this we're going to be successful but internally Maybe there's some doubts about that. And, and where did those doubts come from? And what was the public relations strategy in order to prevent those things from becoming public knowledge, those doubts? Well, uh, that's a really interesting question, and it was very, very hard for those commanding. You take a guy like Simmons who had these very strong opinions. He did not communicate that to the mm. men, and nor could he. Right. Uh, because it, it was his job to make sure that his guys were ready to fight, and you're surely not going to tell them Right. Those kinds of things. Sure. So I have documents, for example, there's ones by Simmons, and there's a few others that I have by folks and um, other individuals, where the circulation was as, you know, five people. Mm-hmm. And I've seen British documents that said similar things that never came to Canada, mm-hmm. but were circulated among just a very, very few people in Britain. Mm-hmm. So people were expressing doubts, but uh, for morale reasons, not just for public relations reasons, but for actually, you know, mm-hmm. to uh, to keep people motivated. Sure. Yeah. Um, you, know what? you don't want to tell guys... What we're doing isn't going to be successful. Yeah. Go have fun. Like. Yeah, you're just not going to say that. No. Um, so, so there are really, really good reasons for them to uh, to take that tack. And later on in the 60s, where you have the, um, you know, you have uh, Mike Dare being interviewed by the parliamentary committee, he does not tell him what he's told John Stars and Allard. Mm. What he basically says is, when when the parliamentary committee, which has uh, some information that allows it to realize that these plans have some problems Mm -hmm. and they keep bringing up these problems he goes well those are worst case scenarios Mm -hmm. and indeed he's right you know that's worst case scenario right and really he has confidence that combat is not going to happen and his job is just to prepare his people so his he he just you know he just does his soldierly job Mm -hmm. which is give me this equipment I can do better give me this I can do better so he's very much saying this is my task this is what I'm going to do and isn't looking at Except for, you know, there are cases where, you know, they have to prepare for things like casualty lists. Like, if they have to do things like, how many reinforcements do I mm-hmm. need? Those are the moments where you see those figures building up and the guys kind of going, you know, the people working on that, it would be difficult mm-hmm. for them to maintain um, kind of a, a high morale right. because they knew. Mm-hmm. And they did know the whole time. Mm-hmm. A few and, people. I mean, soldiers aren't stupid people. They're um, not. Um, did they not look around, at the, the people on the ground look around and at some point say that something maybe doesn't seem right, that maybe they're wondering why they're there, particularly once families start showing up and they're building communities and centers and stuff. I mean, they're saying, we're trained to fight. We're being told to prepare to fight. Yet, everything that's going on around us seems counter to what a military preparedness might be. Yeah. And do they start to wonder what's going on and ask questions? And maybe some doubt creeps in that way. You certainly see some bad moments. Mm. Okay. Some very bad moments. When Brooke Claxton flies over in the early 50s, uh, there's a brigade major who um, commits suicide just before okay. Claxton gets there. And we don't know why he did, but he served as another rank during the Second World War. He would have had to virtually walk on water right. to have become the brigade major of 27 Brigade. Uh, he sh- blows his brains out in the gun room, and uh, the Minister of National Defense and his commander come in and find him there. So were people troubled? I would say so. Mm-hmm. Especially somebody who had actually seen combat, and yeah. had seen combat as another rank. Mm. So there were signs of trouble. At other points, we have a lard coming over in the mid-50s, 58, and making reports about, these men seem to be here simply to become casualties. Mm-hmm. You know, there are reports that come back, but they're secret. Right. They're very, very classified. Mm-hmm. And for the actual guys serving, they do the job they're assigned to do. 
yeah. and they do it as best they can. Yep. And so they're really focused on, if I'm playing Redland, I'm really focused on, can't, and, and there's a lot of rivalry, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to take on that British unit, I just want to be sure that I do the best job. And they always take pride in that kind of performance. Yep. So their focus is very task-oriented. Okay. And they're very disciplined. Mm. So that's the kind of thing you get. So they're more looking at their job in a micro level. Absolutely. As opposed to looking at the macro. Yeah, of take what, that what does hill. it all mean? Right. Take so, that hill. Okay. And do it the best way you can. Right. Yeah, so, so, so these larger policy issues and perhaps even deficiencies in the policy yeah. don't make their way down to these guys. Or if they do, they're not talking about it. Well, they, of course they're not going to talk about it, mm -hmm. right? They're going to talk about what matters, and they've got a lot on their mind. They've got a lot mm -hmm. on their mind in terms of the actual tasks ahead of them, mm -hmm. which they focus on very well. Yeah. And then the other thing that they have on their mind is, I mean, I have this, and I, I have to point it out because it's uh, a, a picture of Hector LeMay. Okay. Uh, who was a commissioner in our building and went over in the early 50s, missed his family very deeply. Uh -huh. And so what he did when he you know, uh, had nothing else to do uh, on Saturday afternoons, he'd go to the German orphanage oh, wow. and did volunteer work with the kids. Oh, that's cool. Oh, and so nice. you do find that, you know, the guys aren't sitting around kind of wasting their time. Right. There, there's other stuff for them to do mm. to engage with. And so when, um, you know, he left his own children behind, that's how he spent his mm. time. So, you know, I, I, I think that in terms of lives and, and how, they, how, how they saw themselves, mm -hmm. um, they would have seen themselves as people doing something important. And I think like any of us in life, right, you, uh, you can shut down. Mm -hmm. If something's really unpleasant, you're going to shut down. But I guess the same question would hold true then for once family starts showing up, um, our, our wives sitting around thinking, this doesn't make sense. I mean, particularly guys who may have seen action in Korea or the Second World War, their wives weren't, you know, hanging out with them, no. and, right? And now the wives and families are allowed to be there. Our families sort of sitting around wondering, why are we... It's great that we're allowed to be here because we like to see them. But something doesn't seem right. No, they're not thinking that at all. Okay. They're not thinking of that at all, as far as I've seen from the okay. evidence. Okay, uh, certainly our librarian at, at work is uh, uh, grew up there, and as she said um, when she uh, she came to one of my uh, little lectures, and she said, "Oh my God, we would have been toast." And she said, "My father must have known that, but my mother sure didn't." Mm. Uh, you know, that, that's a quote sort of from her, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or perhaps not an exact quote, but sure. but, but basically what she, what her reaction was uh, when I talked about how vulnerable they were. So certainly as a young girl in Germany, she didn't see herself as vulnerable. But really, I don't think anybody did. Okay. Because, I mean, everybody's there. Right. And also, I don't think the Canadian government thought they were vulnerable. Mm. If I look at the um, cabinet minutes, when they put the brigade in this vulnerable spot, they knew it was a vulnerable spot. Mm -hmm. But they sure didn't think that there was going to be war. Right. They thought, we'll go there, and the Soviets won't dare attack us. Mm. So, so I really think they were very confident. Sure. In that, sure. There may have been a few moments during the Berlin crisis and the Cuban crisis where, just for a short while, people thought, "Oh my God, what if?" Mm -hmm. But for most of the time, they were very confident. Okay, and and obviously, we, you mentioned the Americans and the British are, are in Germ West Germany at the same time. Did the Americans and the British have similar confidence? Uh, you say this is a vulnerable spot. Obviously, they would be concerned about who's there. Yeah. Did they have that same level of confidence in the Canadians that the Canadians seem to have had in themselves? Well, I'm not sure. It, it or it's maybe not confidence is the right word, but um, well, I don't think um, any of them relied solely on the Canadians. The right. British soldiers. Yeah. If you look at, um, there is a, a place in here where I'm quoting from uh, one of the British um, uh, officers, and the British families are there, and as he said, and this is before Canadian families are allowed to be there, mm -hmm. and he just talks about the fact that you know, we absolutely have to have our families here. It's very important to morale. At that point, British families are. Uh, doing rather well in Germany because they're on occupation funds. Mm. So every single family has a servant. Oh. And <laughs> there's, there's a, a feeling that <laughs> if you're uh, the British in Germany, this is not necessarily a bad lifestyle. Sure. And in addition to that, at one point he, 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 he remarks that they cannot afford to let a single British family member be captured. Mm. And so... Clearly, they don't expect the Germans. Sure. You know, yeah. Clearly, they think there's a, a real uh, unlikelihood mm. that they will be attacked. Mm. Nonetheless, they're building up their defenses. Right. So the book ends in 1964. Mm -hmm. 
So is there a what happens in 1964? Is there a withdrawal of the the brigade or, no. or what? What's the why the end point of 1964 here? Um, I've I've been asked that uh, a lot, and I uh, have just worked on a, a chapter on uh, Pearson. There's a book on Pearson coming out, and okay. I'm preparing a, a, a chapter on. And and really, the time frame from 64 to 68 is very complex. It's not just unification. Mm-hmm. There is a, a, a massive uh, change in NATO strategy. Mm-hmm. There's a massive change in how we negotiate our NATO goals. Um, everything changes. Okay. And so, because of the complexity, I didn't, you know, that four years is another book. Okay. <laughs> That's why okay. I did it. Right. Not because it isn't important mm-hmm. or that it ends. Right. Just to, it's too the complex. Sequel. Well, it's the, the personnel policies. Mm. I, I do a lot of analysis of personnel policies with families. Mm. And um, a, a lot of, you know, if you're a soldier and you're married, you get more money than the soldier who's not married. Mm. You get a married allowance. That all changes in 65. Right. Everything changes. Mm. So too much changes for me to have uh, included. Oh, okay. I was going to ask about unification, but if unification doesn't, you sort of addressed it there, doesn't really affect this in this in this book. Well, unification, uh, there are... There are some uniform policies between the, the uh, three services. Okay. And so, for example, the very thing about families. Hmm. Uh, when the Air Force decides to send families, there yeah. is uh, there are committees with all three okay. services. And when the personnel members committee is meeting and uh, the Air Force decides that, yeah, we're going to send families, Simmons, who has opposed it right along and continues to fight it afterwards, mm-hmm. uh, more or less has to give up because he can't afford to have the Air Force have families and he doesn't. Okay. So there are cases where they just have to have uniform policies. Mm. And so you see lots of instances of uniform policies long before unification. Even though there's distinct armed forces, yeah. they have to sort of share policy. Absolutely. Just practically, from a practical purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So you do find, um, but, but you don't find that, uh, you know, you can kind of, uh, well, you find people do tra- sometimes transfer from one service to another, but not much. Mm. That really doesn't happen much. Okay. So o- overall, this is a, a again a very interesting story. But do, what does this tell us about the Canadian military in, through the fifties and early sixties? Is there an insight here that that can lead us to a greater understanding of Canada's maybe perhaps military policies, military preparedness, but also foreign policy in general? I mean, what what is sort of what is the lesson in all this? Well, I think. One of the things I'd like to draw out is that it does reflect on Canadian social policies. Mm -hmm. And I think it represents uh, quite a change in Canadian society. Mm. And the whole idea that, you know, soldiers' families required support. The Second World War, the end of the Second World War, is the very first time that the Canadian government becomes responsible for the education of dependents. Oh, really? Prior to that time, there is no sense that the Canadian government has responsibility for that. So you see a huge change in the way... Responsibility for children, responsibility for welfare, respo- you know, all those sort of uh, changes in social policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, medical care, mm. access to medical care yeah. for dependents, all those kind of things uh, come into play. So I think what you see is um, military records are a wonderful way of looking at societal change. Mm. So you see a lot of that. Okay. And the other That's thing really that I'd good. like to say in terms of just if, if you're talking about impact, all the people who serve, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who were born in Germany, grew up in Germany, mm-hmm. who had that experience. Mm-hmm. And so those people have gone on to affect Canada and mm-hmm. to see the world in a different way. Mm-hmm. So I actually think that I've only kind of touched the tip of the iceberg mm-hmm. here. I think there's another huge social history in terms of all those people. And I know some of them became professors. Mm-hmm. Uh, they became multilingual. Mm-hmm. Some of them became diplomats. Mm-hmm. You know, they've gone on to do really interesting different things mm-hmm. because that experience where they didn't grow up in, say, a small community in Newfoundland or a small right. community in Nova Scotia or merely go from one military to commu- another military community in Canada, mm-hmm. I think it really changed who they were right. and how they saw the world. Mm-hmm. And I think there were enough of them that it's actually changed the fabric of Canada. Okay, wow. That, that yeah, works. so I think the impact's big. Okay, well, I, and that makes sense, right? I mean, people are going to bring their experiences yeah. to the rest of their lives. And, and I mean, I've, I've met somebody who, obviously different period, who spent time as a kid in Germany, and I think it's a common enough experience that most people have met somebody exactly. who has been there. So it it, it can be a, a common thing, that, and those experiences do affect us, uh, even yeah. those of us who haven't been there. 
yeah, I've never absolutely. been. I've never been to Germany, so. <laughs> but you'd like to go. <laughs> yes, it sounds lovely. It sounds lovely. So the book is Unlikely Diplomats: The Canadian Brigade in Germany, 1951 to 1964. And we should just clarify that while you do work for the Directorate of History and Heritage at National Defense, this is not a National Defense publication. Not at all. And the opinions I've expressed are my own, not yes. those of the department. But I do uh, thank very much all my colleagues uh, in the Directorate and all the soldiers who shared their experience with me, mm. especially Hector LeMay and his family, and all the academics who also have gone ahead, mm. even those I've criticized. I hope they'll forgive me. <laughs> It's just part of the process. I hope so. It's part of the process. So, so, it, yeah. it, so I encourage you to uh, check out the book again, Unlikely Diplomats, The Canadian Brigade in Germany, 1951 to 1964. Isabel Campbell, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Uh, if you have any questions for the podcast, historyslam at gmail.com. Twitter is at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.